Well, here we are again. Welcome, friends, to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, where you are hearing from myself, Jay Fay, Travis, Happy Raccoon. And I'm Matt. The top bun of the hour. Oh, no. Don't call me that, please. It's an old <laughs> name, old username. What's the best part about our digital personas? You know, that first time you walk into a room after getting on Discord, and you're like, who are you? You have oh the name gosh. and the Discord. It's one of the fun parts of running communities, you know, in it's, the modern age. I hate how accurate that is, too, because you're like, oh, you're Shadow Slayer. And it's just like, oh, <laughs> dude, don't call me that, please. <laughs> yeah. And Matt's here with us to talk about the Pittsburgh scene that he helped bootstrap. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I was totally new to the hobby back in uh, October. There was absolutely no kill team scene anywhere to be found. I tried to use like all those resources online uh, to see if there's any kill team players in my area. None whatsoever. So uh, yeah, it's been an awesome community to be a part of. And uh, yeah, can't wait to talk about it with you guys. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So that actually got me thinking about um, what are the online resources that you tried out? Just because maybe uh, someone else wants to check them out as well and maybe see if there's any luck? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The The first one I remember um, distinctively was there's a Reddit kill team uh, like player locator. It's like a geo map. If you guys have ever used one of those, we like drop a pin on... Yep, yep. Uh, you know where you are i tried that one there was one gentleman there uh then that was it and he was i want to say like 30 minutes north of pittsburgh so uh kind of close but it's you know it's one guy i'm not going to go over to his house and <laughs> just because it can you know only be us two so that was the first one i did and then obviously was like the command point discord and the glass half dead discord and you know i tried both of those in there and like the east coast kill team channels nothing there whatsoever uh so i was like okay you know I'll have to I'll have to see what I can do. Start something up. And remember, at this point, I had not even stepped foot in a hobby shop at this point. Uh, and it just turned out Fabricators Forge was the one closest to me. And I remember walked in there, went to the used model room. I was really interested in uh, getting Scions. And they had a couple. And I'm like, okay, I don't want to start a Scions army because uh, it's a <laughs> lot of money and I'm cheap. So I'm like, you know what? What's this kill team thing? I think it's like small scale. I watched a uh ben from i think it's battle brothers tabletop made a video on scions at the time because this was back i think whenever uh custodes were for apl and people were saying like scions were going to be the team to beat them because they had strong ap and i'm like oh this is gonna be like a meta team too this is gonna be great this is the game for me uh now i don't even play scions but uh <laughs> it's uh that's how i got into it really was just um i'm just extremely cheap i guess but uh, i grew to love the game and i was just happy to teach other people about it it's definitely a common story, I think, amongst players. It's like, you know, this 40K stuff, I remember being really fun as a kid. But, you know, now do I really want to spend like $400 to build an army and paint it all. So now, like, just getting in on a small scale, that's where Kill Team is like at its sweet spot. And, you know, this week on this podcast, we've got two whole sets of teams for us to t chat about and some upcoming tournaments along with your upcoming tournaments, right, Matt? That's right. Yep, we got one later this week. And now by the time this episode air, it airs, it will be, uh, you know, past, but that's fine. Uh, we have a monthly tournament here at uh, Fabricators Forge in Coriopolis. It's basically Pittsburgh. Coriopolis is like 10 minutes from Pittsburgh. Um, but yeah, it's at Fabricators Forge, and it is the third Saturday of every month. So it's a four-round tournament. Starts at uh, 9 a.m. registration, 10 a.m. dice on tables. So if you are anywhere close into this area, we've had guys come out from an hour, hour and a half out. Uh, we're, you know, growing scene. I'd like to think that we're a pretty solid community. So I hope to see some new faces there. And uh, yeah, I look forward to it. Yeah, that sounds great. Generally, how many people come out to each one of these events? Yeah, it's, it's been good. The for, even the first one, um, I know you guys spoke with uh, Sheldon last week. Uh, from Kill Team Stream, and he kind of talked about how his first tournament um, was pretty nice, and then it kind of like dipped off. We've been seeing growth ever since then. We had about an eight-person tournament uh, for the first one, and then it was 12 for the one in, I want to say, November, because I think that was when it into the dark launch. I think that was kind of like in December, January. Middle of last right? year. Middle or, of last, middle last I think year. I, I think it got announced, oh. and then it came out in like September. September. Oh, wow, yeah, time is flying. It was around yeah. then. We had we had our first Into the Dark tournament. That was about 12. And our la our latest one was, I want to say, about 14. We had a couple of drops there, but we had like 14, 15 registrations. So it's been great. Uh, a lot of growth there. Um, yeah, to see so, so quickly, solid. too. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. Yeah, being able to live in, you know, denser city centers definitely helps people get to their shops. 
I assume that's definitely helped on your end. Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Pittsburgh's a really good city for that, where you just have all these like little small suburbs um, outlying in the city. So we, uh, you know, you'll hear about places like town you've never even heard of that this guy's from, but they don't have a hobby shop near them, right? So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the, we, I want the Forge to kind of be that resource for them. So at this point, it's just trying to uh, broadcast that out uh, as much as possible and kind of just be that resource for people. To be like, hey, if you want to, you know, roll some dice, play some kill team, and you're like even remotely close. Come on down. You know, we try to make it as consistent as possible as a place to just, uh, you know, set up shop. Yeah, consistency is definitely something I have found very useful in the New York scene. Just having every first Saturday of every month, like we've been doing it for over a year now. And that's definitely helped. We've had sometimes we have like event days. So I think after we'd been going for like six months, I had a day where we added a bunch of terrain rules to each board. So that helped like spice things up for regulars. Because, you know, if you keep going every month, sometimes it can get a little stale because some people have the same teams or, you know, people don't change teams that often. So having some event days is nice. We just had our team tournament. So, yeah, definitely a cool thing. Nice. How'd that go? I'm kind of curious how you'd run like a team tournament. How'd that so go? we did a doubles tournament. Um, when you do doubles on BCP, you need to set it up front for the event. Otherwise, like something on the back end is a little bit weird. And we set up our event so that there was kind of a, a staggered rule change over the three rounds. I only do three rounds because my goal is to have a more casual, friendly environment rather than a four round. Because a lot of people feel pretty exhausted by the th- end of the third round locally. Yeah. Um, so our first round, we let people borrow CP from their ally. Second round, we let them um, trade a third of their team over. And then in the last round, we traded a third of their team. And if you borrowed a CP, you could reroll a reroll dice. So that oh. really ramped up like players like, oh, God, <laughs> I had someone. There was one player who rolled a reroll a reroll on Plasma and died. And there was someone who like made the roll that they needed to like save the turn. So it was pretty fun. Pretty that's fun to cool. listen to. No, I love that. That's that's really creative. And it's smart, too. Like you said, um, is if you're seeing, you know, kind of doing the same thing, you're seeing the same people. That kind of variety is absolutely key. It's not something I've thought about myself because, you know, it's just such a new scene here, but it's a fantastic idea. I'll definitely be marking that one down for sure. Yeah, there's a, a kill zone register from one of the white dwarfs, and they have a bunch of extra terrain rules. So one of our events was like each table got their specific terrain rule. So it's like a statue is inspiring. If you stand next to it, you get a four up feel no pain. So people are like running to the statues and like fighting around them. So having those little like moments where people get to do something new, I think is nice for tournaments, especially if it's a longer running scene. I think for a newer scene, probably like keep it tight. But eventually yeah. people, once they're experienced, it's like bring up new experiences too. Yeah. And I feel like you could lace a lot of that stuff in with like some narrative events too, which like in, in the local scene over here, people have been talking about like setting up just like a one day tournament that has like a narrative twist to it um, as just kind of a fun little thing to do. Um, but yeah, using some terrain, terrain rules for that would be pretty nifty. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, even like the latest, um, the last box here for Into the Dark had really cool, uh, what do they have, like drop pods in them now? Uh, yep. yeah, like I'm not a narrative player, but those rules are just fun and that would be a great idea, you know, for like a narrative tournament to incorporate some of those. So yeah, you guys are chock full of good ideas. I like it. Yeah. You could even do, I think in the box with the exaction squad, there's the, breachable walls so you could have right. those i think that would be very amazing. yeah those are sweet like one of those core rules for people the the breacher what's his name the guy with the chain fist finally gets to do that thing that they did in that battle report all those months ago where they teased that and then said oh wait no he can't do that yeah well we, we've made a mistake you can't cut through the bulkheads <laughs> it's just too dangerous what has been one of the more rewarding parts for you spinning up the local scene? Because I know, you know, you were saying that Pittsburgh didn't really have anything before you started. So like, yeah, uh, I think for for myself, what was just so rewarding was just like seeing that growth that I mentioned. And it just so quickly, um, you know, when you're the literally the only one that knows what kill team is at that point, you kind of have to be that resource for everybody else um, for them to look to, right? Like, okay, how does this work? Is this how this, um, you know, interacts and whatnot? So (laughs) starting out, it was a lot of battle reports that I've watched on YouTube, a lot of reading the code, like the uh, compendium and stuff and just understanding all of this. Uh, And a testament to like the community as a whole, everyone, like there's so many good resources to learn this game that I just point people towards. Like there's that ultimate doc that I found online it's a big living Google Doc that basically makes one-page rules for every faction. Um, so what I did was I printed all of those out 
um, all the teams at the time, a copy for everyone. So that way, if a 40k player comes in, he's got his army, he's got his, I don't know, he's got his Harlequins, right? Or he's got his Death Guard. I'm like, hey, I uh, just saw you finish your 40k game. You got like two, like, you know, hour and a half. I can teach Kill Team real quick. Here's the, you know, the sheet for him. Uh, and, uh, you know, off to the races, we'd go. We'd go. So um, going from nothing and kind of just like sitting around and just kind of having to be that resource. And then now being able to say, hey, you come out on a Friday here at the Forge for our casual nights, and you have six people, eight people consistently out there, and now they're telling people how to play. It's just, it's incredible to see. Like, And it's, it makes me just so happy uh, that I was the starting resource for for some of these, for most of these guys uh, out there at the Forge. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's gotta be the growth more than anything to see. Yeah, I've yeah. heard a bunch of times people talking about just like hitting that point of momentum. So if you're a listener and you're starting a local scene and it feels overwhelming, just know that it will hit a point where it just the community will take on its own momentum. You just got to hit that threshold and then it'll just kind of grow and pop off on its own. Absolutely. Yeah, spot on. Because I've had uh, practically months where I, would, I was away, um, you know, whether for vacation or what have you, for work, and uh, someone else stepped up. But I know whether it was we have uh, Alex, I'll give some shout outs like Alex that are seen knows the rules very well. Adam, who is the uh, undefeated champion. He's won our store tournament four times in a row now. He's an animal. Uh, he's an animal. Uh, former 40, he still plays 40K, but he's a fantastic resource as well. Uh, so it's one thing to teach somebody and have them understand. But then they themselves also become a resource that you can bounce ideas off of. So you're not just the definitive. This is how it is. It's nope. this is another informed opinion. Uh, and you know, you can kind of, uh, work on it from there, but yeah, it just, it, it really is that, that snowball effect you mentioned is just absolutely true. hundred percent. When you were working up to building up that momentum, did you have any like strong friction points that you bumped into and like, how did you make it through those? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, I try to forget those days, man. Uh, no, it's, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. So, yeah. no those, are hard, those are the they, hard parts of the, you know, of running and stuff. For sure. Like, so my logic going into it was the most overlap there's going to be with the kill team is going to be 40k players. Uh, so what I did was um, at the Forge Thursday nights are for our 40k night. So I got in there right whenever I got off work, I would um, and big shout to the Forge, by the way, it is an incredible um, just like floor of tables. There's like so many tables. So I just found a, a table corner of the room, uh, set up that s- the small little kill team mat. At the time, we had no mats that were the Help me out here, boys. 22 Regulation by 30. Size. Yeah, 20, 22, 22 by 30. 30. 22 yeah. by 30, yeah. Nothing. So I'm taking out, I had that starter set at the time. I had that that little fold-out paper uh, mat right there, flatten that thing out best I can, you know, with all the creases in it and everything. <laughs> all of my unpainted Octarius terrain. Uh, set up the board, had orcs on one side, my 10 vet guard on the other, and like, and I, you know, just, just roll with it. I'd sit down on like, uh, you know, I'd sit down, I brought a book with me, and I would just say, hey, you know, as people walk by, or, you know, I would just walk by, I like to think I'm pretty personable with some of these guys, with a lot of people. So I just, you know, would strike up conversations and I would make it natural. I wouldn't be like, you know, in the middle of their game, like, oh, did you hear about Kill Team? Like preaching the good word. Like, no, <laughs> I would, uh, you know, try to like, just like, and then when they say like, you know, oh, what do you play? I'm like, oh, you know, I'm more of a Kill Team guy. I'm really enjoying it. You know, if you ever want to learn, I'm here, that kind of thing. So, uh, and we, I've had nights uh, that where nobody wanted to learn and i wouldn't force that on people so i'd be spending two three hours kind of just you know sitting reading my books and uh you know just talking to people which is fine i like talking to people anyway but you know going in with that expectation that hey maybe i can finally play some kill team here and then not having that that was rough right because i just wanted to roll dice i wanted to get these games in and nobody was there so um you know, I was pretty persistent. I even tried to get into the skirmish game community a little bit there uh, at the Forge. So like, you know, the Warcry guys, uh, Firefight. Is it called Firefight? I'm not good with the other non-GW I think there's games. Firefight. There's Infinity. Infinity. And, uh, yeah. There's MCP nowadays, MCG, which is pretty yep. big. Yeah. Yeah. So there's... there's a lot of overlap there. So I started hitting them up as well uh, and just kind of rolled with it from there. But yeah, just it really is just persistence. And those sticking points, I'm not going to lie. Like, you know, they're going to suck at first. It really can be discouraging because like, what's the point? But just trust me, like whenever you you meet those first couple of people that you can really click with and you start seeing them come out on their own when you're not just having to like, you know, ping them on Discord like, hey, man, you coming out tonight? Like, no, it's uh, when they start coming out on their own without you bugging them. That's that's when, you know, and it, it's it's only upwards from there. And I mean it. 
it's definitely a really fun part when you're like you're teaching all these people and then finally people are like oh i actually kind of want to play and then they ping you for the first yes. time like, yeah let's go let's go play <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yeah the uh i think jason you've probably had similar situations right where you're just working on trying to build the scene <laughs> Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, So like our scene, like the big news for us lately is we've actually branched out and we're super close to hitting a point where we will where we will have kill team available seven days a week within like the the metro area. Um, So that is very exciting. Um, It was it all kind of like happened accidentally because we found like a nice big game store with a huge parking lot and like it had like they had food and drinks and everything. Um, and then we had a pretty big following that was growing there. And like, you know, we had like 18 people show up every week for like a whole month. And then the store introduced a new policy that just like bucked everybody off the wagon. So we're just like, it, it was like, you got to pay $10 to get in the door. And then like, otherwise Aww. you can't have a table. And, but there was like still a ton of stores that people loved that weren't doing stuff like that. So then when that happened, we're like, you know what? Let's, this club is, is like a Hydra now. Like you cut off the one head and seven <laughs> more are going to pop up. So then like, um, 20 miles apart, we have like five different locations that are all set up. So it's like every Monday we meet in like Fridley and every Tuesday we meet in Minneapolis and every Friday we meet in like St. Louis park and whatever. Um, that's actually not true, but, uh, we've got a discord and if you want to figure out exactly what it is and you're in the twin cities, um, let me know. And, uh, but yeah, it's cool. We've got, um, we're just going to add a couple more spots onto it and then we'll have kill team available every day. That's that's incredible. Like, what what a testament to your community, eh? Like to to have like a roadblock like that where you all congregated at one spot so consistently, and then something like that happens, and you're just able to pivot like that. Like, I think that's that's a really really incredible. Yeah, it's been really exciting to see like all these different game nights actually work out. That sounds really cool. I mean, I haven't been able to set something up like that in New York, so I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> right um and like half of the key to actually make it work because everyone will kind of like hum and ha and be like i don't know what should we do and it was just like you know what i'm like just like make it so and like in our discord we have a designated thread per day of the week so it's like the day of the week the city it's going to be in and then the name of the store and then like the day before or the day of like that channel goes live where people are like who's going to be there tonight and then like four or five people say like i'll show up and then like a couple people bring a couple couple people and then like they're in the store and then like people walk by and they're like oh what are all these people playing this cool looking game and then they tell them about it and then like four more people join the discord and then the next day it all happens again and ever since we did that i feel like the the growth rate has just like doubled yeah talk about making the best out of a bad situation because it's one thing to try to grow your scene locally but with what you're doing you're going to all these different stores that's a different you know consumer base that are people are being exposed to so you're not it's not the same people who come in you know every night and seeing that kill team is okay we know what it is it's it's totally different stores it's a totally different amount of people like that's that's really cool that's got to be incredible for growth like that's yeah it's really really exciting Um, and then I'm also part of the, the planning crew for a big wargaming convention that we have in Minnesota every year in November. And, um, I'm the guy that is in charge of kill team for that. So we just kind of started chatting about that. It's called the renegade open. And, um, now we're just kind of like trying to figure out and negotiate if we can get enough space to do like a bigger tournament than we've ever done before. And, um, the most space we had, in the past was to support 24 players so hopefully we can uh get it set up for 32 maybe even more we'll see let's go break through man i like it have any of your players started um getting the itch to go to bigger tournaments matt Oh yeah, there's rumblings, especially because people can only lose to Adam so many times before they're like, "We gotta fight someone else." Like, we you gotta... guys gotta, you guys gotta bring Adam out too. You know, release him into the uh, wild. No, don't worry, I'm whispering in his ear, especially with you guys up in New York. Like, that's that's pretty reasonable. I've been in New York multiple times uh, for hockey when I played, so I know it's not that bad of a drive. So I, I'm, I'm like I said, I'm whispering in his ear, like, "Hey, you think you're good, man? There's, this is a, this is you're a big fish in a small pond. Yeah. We're gonna 
Take you we've out. Got, take... We've in our area. We've got Atlantic City open. You know, yeah. next month we've got Kansas City, which is a plane flight, not too crazy. <laughs> and then uh, we'll have a couple, at least a handful of other tournaments this year. You know, if Jason's Jason spins up, we'll also have like two or three in November. So yeah, we were looking at Atlantic City open here as well. So yeah, fingers crossed we can get something going. Yeah, we just I'm the, play. I'm the TO for that one. So oh, if you guys nice. have any questions, feel free to ask. But yeah, it sounds like if Adam is the local monster, set, unleash him on the wild. I think I just might. Yeah, his he, he thing is he refuses to play another team until someone can dethrone him at our scene. He's been playing Legionnaires. Uh, uh. Yeah, untouched. Yeah. But it's funny, too, because it's like we can't say that he's like playing like too OP of a team. Like, I think they're just like a solid A tier team like they've always been. I really don't think because he's pivoted now. He's going to be bringing, uh, I think mostly zinch and like a couple marks of uh marks of corn now i think he's like outright cut nurgle altogether since the since the nerf so we'll see how well he does with that but he's a fantastic player uh the testament to him uh is whenever i played against him in a most recent tournament i brought exaction squad so of course that is gonna go great for me because we all know how good exaction squad is into elites but yep. um uh, oh yeah one with, of the best oh, one of the best yeah. <laughs> with its one source of ap one it's great uh, but I in the very first turning point, his plasma gunner run into the dark at this point, dashes out, goes to shoot, rolls. Uh, he gets two ones, he overcharged two ones, CP re rolls both into two more ones. So that's Amazing. six mortal wounds, and he still won that game. So, I mean, I, I don't think I'm that bad of a player, I think it's more of a <laughs> test of it to uh, him being very good. He just pulled me apart by the seams, uh, kind of like made me uh, make. You know, even if in times where I'd win initiative, it's like, okay, I'll win this side here, but he's making a play over elsewhere. He's just really good at kind of having that, you know, Rue Goldberg type design where it's like, okay, this is going to happen. And should this fail here, this will still work. He's just got all these fallbacks. So he's a, he's a fantastic player. I'm happy to have him at our scene. I think I'm lucky to have him at our scene because he's also good at, I'm good at teaching people rules. He's good at showing people how to actually apply those rules into like game theory. So you know, yeah. if, uh, now, like I said, just got to bring him out to some of these bigger tournaments. We'll see how good he really does. But no, nah, he's a great guy. I just want to make a quick comment on the fact that you referred to uh, the his like tactical mechanism as a Rube Goldberg machine. And I love that. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically just our whole game. You know, we start yeah. we start with a bunch of models and dice and we just Rube Goldberg our way through the rest of the just game. Just Rube Goldberg really your way to victory. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Part of the fun part of building up these local scenes is then when people finally start going to like larger tournaments, they come back with all these stories and all these like different like change plays. And I think that part, that growth was a really big thing for me running the New York scene because of the, the Kill Team Open this year. We had, I think, 20 people almost show up in like a 80 person tournament. So it was really cool just seeing how well everybody did throughout the course of that day or the two days. So I'm hoping you get the same experience soon. I'm sure it's coming. Uh, it, like I said, whether it's just my community, but I think the Kill Team community as a whole is just so supportive that I really just can only see it going upwards from here. So do you normally play Exaction Squad, or was that just kind of a, I'm being the TO, I'll just play something fun? and That's you exactly know. it. That's exactly it. They were the new team at the time. Uh, I thought, you know, um, ironically, I didn't like the models that much, uh, so I actually hmm. proxied uh, the um, Necromunda team. The, uh, the Palatine Enforcers. Palanite, Palanite yes. Enforcers. Yep. Yeah, oh, yeah. Models and are I so gave cool. Them, they are really cool. And like they're they're um I'm a TO. I'm pretty big on sticklers for now the base sizes weren't right. I got the right base sizes for them. That was all good. But like the the height of them and like the bulk for like visibility sake and all that, they're practically one to one. They're a little bit wider in the shoulders, but otherwise they're pretty spot on the official models. So um they are really good proxy. I recommend them. Uh and I gave them a nice little like dead space inspired theme with the glowing visors that I was pretty happy with. But that was just one tournament. Now if I'm if I'm going to like my main team, it's gotta be uh breachers because I've I've loved the SWAT aesthetic that they have, uh, right? With like you know, big boy with shield, the combo plays. I never thought I'd be like a combo player, but you know, having um, you know an idea in your head and executing on it and seeing how it play, plays out is extremely uh, enticing for me, and it's fun watching that kind of pay off. So for me, it's still breachers as like my main team. I'm dabbling in other teams right now, but if you're asking me, you know, uh, you know, got to answer, you know, five seconds on the clock. What are you playing? I'm playing Breachers. On that topic, we have yeah. a new segment we're going to preview today for oh. Operative Showdown. Operative Showdown. What and a segue. We're here to quiz. We're here to quiz people on their favorite teams. 
So when it comes to the Breachers, if you were going to pick between the Surveyor and Cat versus the Void Jammer and Geist Skull, you know, what are your pros and cons? Which ones do you lean towards? What Ooh. is your, out of those two, if you could only have one on the team, which would it be? I like it. I like it. So the Void and Geist Skull, much flashier, right? It probably like, a, you know, that bigger payoff. But if I'm playing it, you know, in a tournament, it's got to be the Surveyor and Cat. The Cat is just so useful, not only for its ability uh to, you know to flip that order but being able to give apl through it is so nice because don't forget yeah. surveyor does not have casterkin uh or you know uh compendium guard level uh recon plus one apl right he's got that range restriction he's got six inch range that's not good for a horde team that needs to be spaced out everywhere and trying to pull your opponent you know every which way so that cat being that little bubble of six inches of plus one apl gives you so much more threat range uh, that I gotta give it to the Surveyor and Cat. Not nearly as fun uh, as that Void and Geist Skull. Yes, the Geist Skull stun is nice. Yes, the, the you know the explosion is good into elites, but I just I can't. It's so hard to knock off that Surveyor and Cat for me. Yeah, I mean the Surveyor and Cat is a very very strong pair, and having an opponent shoot down the Cat, you're like, it's really not that bad as yeah. long as he's done part of his job. Like it's fine. Giving me oh, one yeah. shot or giving you an APL. Um, push that you weren't allowed to get originally or even just the recon to like set up and force your opponent away from things yep. those have all been things that in my experience have been quite annoying and For even sure. if the only thing the cat accomplished was your opponent like you know because like the amount of offense that an enemy team can put out is pretty limited so like if they can shoot you without being shot back and they spent that action killing the cat like that's a little bit you know it's like hmm, better than my plasma gun yeah, absolutely. Yeah, your your Chaos Legionnaire just spent, you know, one of his sacred 8-3 APL shooting out my little robot with, like, five wounds, two defense dice. Like, be my guest, by all, by all means. Now, one thing I did want to say, though, is that one cool thing that you can do this almost edged out the Void and Geist Skull for me is one cool thing I've seen people do is... So if you drop the Geist Skull, logic dictates that you should drop the Void Jammer as well, right? Because he's, what is he going to do? He's just a normal body. But... And if you are worried about activation economy as a breacher player, what you can do is you could still take the void jammer and instead of a normal GA2 guardsman. Because what that does then yeah. is assuming you're taking uh, maybe like surveyor and another armsman or just surveyor and cat, that can either give you a GA2 activation, one to one. So you'll have like, you know, two normal armsmen, or you'll have three armsmen uh, and, or, you know, three armsmen and a void jammer. And I kind of have like that activation control. So if you value activation economy in that matchup, if you're kind of like doing the math in your head, you can absolutely take the Void Jammer and have him just be uh, an extra activation for you. Maybe it's to bait out um, something important from your opponent. Like if you're playing Vet Guard and you're, you want to really get that sniper up the board or really want him to activate so he's not waiting. So that is something cool you can do. But again, Surveyor and Cat, it's got to be That's, my go-to. That is quite novel. I had not even thought about that situation. That's cool. Have you, have cool. you, have you done it? No, I have not done it. I value having the armsman bodies too much and huh. that GA2 activation. I really don't put too much stake in activation economy myself. I'm probably just not good enough to recognize it. I value being able to say, I now have four APL on my side of uh, the board to activate before you get to go and do your thing. So that's, you know, in my eyes, that's probably like a move mission action, move shoot, or, you know, uh, mission action charge, you know, charge block you, something like that. So I value four APL over... Um, activation orders and that back and forth, uh, you know, mechanic. I think uh, but... generally on open is where activation gaming matters a little bit more because once your opponent is committed to the board, it's much easier to find alternate angles on either side of the flank to catch a shot. So I think mm. that's where maybe it could come into play. Whereas like in the dark, having the pair means that you have another area where you can effectively breach and clear through a door. So, but yeah. that, that is very novel. I had not actually thought about that. So that's actually pretty interesting. <laughs> Glad I was able to help drop a little nugget of wisdom on you guys. I'd hope I played these guys quite a bit. Uh, but yeah, there's there's some really cool... The obvious um, tricks to this team, to Breachers as a whole, is they're obvious, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Grenadier, you give him that plus one APL through the Breach and Clear strat ploy. Excuse me, tack ploy. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he alpha strikes deep up the board, you know, attack... Well, actually, you can't attack order him anymore, thanks to that nerf. But uh, you could still do close assault, get those free hits. Um and blitz so like that's still apparent 
But yeah, there's a lot of fun tricks you can do with this team. A recent one I did was, you know, you put the hole in the wall from the hatch cutter. Um, and then the melt. So people think you pair the hatch cutter with the axe jack, right? That's two good melee threats. Now they have charge range through a wall. But what you can do is also is like uh, bring a melt gunner. Now that melt gunner, he dashes through that gap or he moves through the gap. But you make sure he has enough movement left, whether it's from a dash or a move to after he's, you know, done his thing and he's, you know, shot, dash him back through the wall. Because don't forget, you're the only one that can move through that hole in the wall. Breach your operatives. Your opponent can't. So now you've kept that, uh, that Melty Gunner, who likely would have just gotten his head taken off at the next activation, or whenever your opponent decided, now he's safe. Well, relatively safe. But, so, you know, so tons of fun tricks with this team. And that's, that's all the more them. reason to bring that... Uh, uh, the Void Jammer is the one that hands out the APL? Uh, surveyor. The, the surveyor. surveyor does. Void Jammer is the guy skull guy. Yeah. yeah. Void Jammer hands out the minus APL from the guy skull. So if you take yes. the guy skull, the Void Jammer is just, he's just out there as a GA1 armsman. Exactly right. Yeah. I feel like that trick with uh, send a guy through the wall, shoot, and then come back through it, you could do with the grenade guy too. Yes, you can. Yep. Absolutely. That'd be a pretty spicy combo. That is a nice combo. If, if you're going to do something that intense. Yeah, I'm like, you got to bring some sour cream to cool down your opponent's mouth after you give them that kind of spice. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> no, the team is, uh, it is why I love them, because it's it's plays that I didn't even think might have worked when I was, uh, like, it's a team that you need to have a plan, but you can also just be like, hmm, I never thought of trying Axe Jack and Endurant before. Endurance, the guy with the shield, mind you. So it's like, you know, like, oh, they're kind of close to each other. Why not? Let's see what can happen. And then it happened. And then you try the breaching clear with them. You're like, hey, that actually went pretty well. Or, you know, hey, maybe next time I try it with this operative instead. So I just feel the, the, skill, the skill ceiling for that team is just through the roof. So did you play the breachers in your own personal tournaments? Or when you run those tournaments, are you mostly just in a, an observer or helper role? Uh, I do play in my own tournaments. I know that's a point of contention. I've talked to people about it. Um, now, obviously, if there's a rule discrepancy, we defer to someone else. I'm not going to be like the definitive one and say, like, oh, it's my, my tournament, my, my rules. Not that at all. Um, I do play in my own tournaments. Yep, so I'll bring my Breachers like um, when they were the new team and I fell in love with them. I play them tournament after tournament. That Exashkin squad was a one-off. And with this upcoming tournament, I may bring out the Breachers again because I just want to beat Adam for Pete's sake. But... Um, I may bust out an elite team that uh, uh, I've been working on. I've never played an elite team, and I'm such a hipster that I can't just play a meta one like Intercessor or Legionnaires. So I'm bringing out Warp Coven and uh, probably going to hate myself. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think to, to – I struggle against elites, I feel, as a player, person who mainly plays Horde teams. So if I want to learn how to better play against them – I got to bring them myself. So I'm probably bringing Warp Coven to this latest one. I'm probably going to get my teeth kicked in, but it's an, ex it's a, an excuse to play four games of Kill Team in a day and really try to understand a team, especially a team as complex as Warp Coven. So, but uh, yeah, I play in my, in my own tournaments to answer your question there, Travis. That's pretty cool. I mean, I <laughs> yeah. personally don't do it because I want to like stay focused on people, but I totally get it. If we don't have a lot of Kill Team going on, it's like, I just want to play. I totally oh, yeah. get that. Oh, the, the mental Actually, strain is is insane too. Because not only yeah. are you having to worry about your game, you got to take yourself out of it real quick and be like, okay, uh, you know, what's the situation? Because I'll get called over, and it, yeah. it, I I want to say get called over like three or four times around, but it's fine. I love that kind of stuff. I really do like looking at a board state and and like kind of like it's like a pop quiz. It's like, hey, what what's the ruling here? Is this obscuring? You know, is he in cover? And I love that kind of stuff. I don't know. Maybe I'm weird, but no, it's fun cool. to me. So. I mean, that's part of the fun of being a TO. You get to, you are your scene. You are like the heart and soul of your scene. And if you can handle it and people are cool with it, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you want to learn how to play Warp Coven, we've got one of the top Warp Coven players on our Discord. Oh, let's go. Yeah. I, you know, George, is, he was on our podcast a couple episodes talking about the Toronto scene. Mm. And he's part of our, you know, our new Discord. So if any listeners want to join our Discord, we'll have links in the show notes. I'll have to give that a listen. I'm from Toronto myself. I live in Pittsburgh now, but I was uh, I was born in Canada originally. So I guess uh, we uh, we Toronto guys have good taste in kill teams. I guess I'll have to yeah. uh, I'll have to hit them up for that. It's fun. If you listen to our episode, I kind of goad him into talking about Warp Coven, and he, he's been trying to get himself off of Warp Coven. But once I got him on the topic, he went off for he went off for a bit. <laughs> yeah, a he bad, had lots of little habit. nuggets of wisdom too. So yeah, we have our new Discord and our Patreon. Um, so if anybody wants to see those, those are in our show notes. Please give us. Any anything that you can, if you want to, and uh, any any likes on the podcast would be all great. the cool kids are doing it. Nine out of ten dentists would recommend it. I can attest. I gave you guys a nice five stars on Spotify, so you know I did hey. my part. I'm doing my part. Uh, I hope to see everyone else too. Agreed. That's, that is great. So 
are do you have any players uh worried about the new teams for Ooh. this month because i know this month you know it's the month of may and we got a brand new four teams ahead of schedule for most people yeah this was uh out of the out of the blue right i think a lot of people we were all expecting gallo fall but then for them to drop the uh the cults and yeah. imperial agents was really cool too but our store we we lucked out we got a box so we will have officially at least one beast um, and player and one Votan player on our scene. Uh, I think because I think they're splitting the box. But cool. um, yeah, it's uh, I am. I did have to make that call because we didn't get that box until last week. I did say that uh, we're going to ban them for this upcoming tournament because I want some players to have some exposure to that team before immediately having a tournament. Uh, you know, right after not actually getting some games to at least understand the team's mechanics. Because I want to try to avoid gotcha moments and people to have experience against that team um, for the most part. But, you know, afterwards, everything will be kosher. I will never ban a team because they're too strong. My thing is I will stop a team. I'll ban a team if, like, literally their release, like in this case with Gallo Fall, if the box was not in our hands a week before the tournament, I cannot say that, hey, you can bring that team to tournament. Because I just don't think that's fair to my players. Yeah, I think uh, the goal is fairness, right? If yep. a team is strong, the team is strong. You can play that team. Someone else can play the team. Someone could be new with the team and not know the rules. Like those are all things that are within the realm. So it's like just because the team is good and everyone on the internet says they're broken, like Beastmen, there's still ways to play around it. Like this weekend, yeah. I played, you know, Beastmen versus Casterkin, and Casterkin actually have a handful of tools that can uh, keep Beastmen under control, which I found very oh, interesting. Oh man, I hadn't even thought about that. I feel like Casterkin, you can just auto crit someone, so it's just like, oh, your whole cool thing. Take a yeah, knife exactly. to the brain, mud boy. Yep, yep. So Scion Blades were really critical in making it so that when Beastmen came into a fight with uh, the four to six wound breakpoint, there is a couple chances for you to actually send them into Frenzy, which, you know, ends their activation. So if they charge you, you have a couple spots where you can win. And then once they are Frenzied, you can actually guarantee crits when you go into melee. So that was really nice. You also have good guns to chip damage. Because the real thing on open is if you can chip on the goats, it really neuters their ability to win combat aggressively. Like they have to win combat with you charging them and fighting. So yeah. being able to flame people, having the las volley, and then the demo mine is great against the goats because they oh, just yeah. they just can't walk on top of a point because you can elite point your way through a goat and they just die on their activation. It's all very solid advice. I feel like this is, a, you know what, maybe I'll call that a spoiler alert and we'll slide right into niche tactics. Niche tactics. Where we'll talk <laughs> even more about what should we do against Beastmen. Is the sky really falling? For what it's worth, I, th I think Beastmen on In the Dark do appear at least relatively strong. Um, one of the biggest things, I think the guiding principle when I'm looking at fighting Beastmen is that you really want them to not like you don't want to kill them on their turn like on an off turn you want them to die on their activations so chip damage is really really important you're not actually shooting to kill so like plasma it's not actually that good against them no absolutely I, I agree blast weapons that bring them down to 2 hp 3 hp here yes they'll have war paint so they can ignore injured and, and apl modifiers but i absolutely agree and I, don't, I don't see that getting talked about enough travis is uh just chipping them down so that you can kill them on their activations rather than putting them into frenzy during yours and just getting killed um in response and another yeah. thing too that i've noticed is i don't think ploys uh whether they're strat or attack ploys um that gave a operative auto crit or like a free crit were like that good for a lot of teams but i think now with that stipulation that hey you got to strike these guys with the crit in melee if you want to kill them I, I look at teams like blooded with their gaze of the gods or even my boys in warp coven uh avian talons is a not a very good boon i don't think anybody ever considered it oh, but yeah. yeah now i'm bringing that up now that's on my roster because it's like hey um Maybe it's a, it's a key operative for them. Maybe it's that guy that goes back and forth with his with his blades, whatever he moves to engage it rains and does mortal wounds or whatever. Um, you know, I hit him with a, a psychic spell and I put him into frenzy. I charge him. I fight him because of avian talents. I'm guaranteed a crit. Get a crit. If I don't run the crit on the dice, I'm getting a crit and I'm just killing him outright. So um, I think a lot of those kind of like slept on um, tack ops. I want to I say I tell people who are kind of freaking out about this. Give it time. Look at your look at your team again. Maybe you got something that can help you deal with these uh, these frenzied goat men. Yeah, that's a great point. One of the big points is uh, I don't know if maybe not a lot of listeners played in the early parts of this edition, but Void Dance or Harlequins, the precursors to the current Void Dancers, used to be kind of a menace in early edition. However, they had one very glaring weakness was that they just had no long range threat output whatsoever. And Beastmen also are, are 
exists in the same box where there's just no long range threat whatsoever. So if you're playing on open, you just start everyone on engage and you just everyone is looking for a shot, which Absolutely. is which is very, very scary. So like teams like Vetguard, I think, are especially really good at setting up against uh, the Beastmen because on in the dark, they have access to the hand axes. So you can scrap and melee guarantee a couple hits. So if your opponents ever charge you, you can guarantee at least three damage back. So you're really just angling to get shots, bust out your flamer, do all that, do all that good stuff that you're doing, you know, kind of like the caster can. And then on open, you take the bolter, like the the hot shot capacitors. So you're mm-hmm. hitting for three, four. So all the chip damage matters. So like maybe Beastmen are going to be really good. They will for sure punish players who have not thought about the matchup a single time. That is going to be where they are at their scariest. Definitely a Gellerpox situation where you cannot play this play against this team like you would a normal team. You're gonna have to go in and kind of play play this game a little bit differently, more defensively. And that kind of got me thinking too about like we know at this point that the teams are balanced against one another um, in play testing, right? So Beastmen were tested against Votan, and you might wonder like why Beastmen kind of look so strong out of the box. I think it's honestly because Votan are like the perfect antithesis to Beastmen. They are a defensive-minded team that can really hunker down, let the enemy come to them, and just pick them apart with just like these massive like ranged weapons. So yes. That Goatman is now frenzied, but it's like, you know, as soon as he comes in, I just got to hit him with a crit and he's dying. And oh, don't forget, grudge tokens, they're giving you those crits. So I think, um, you know, maybe that be a, a reason as to why the uh, Beastmen exist in the state that they are. But you got to give a nod to Votan as well. I think we might be seeing this team might be an answer if Beastmen start running wild. Yep. For what it's worth, I think people kind of are sleeping on Votan, like the Votan rules in general. They read like just a very solid team. They've got the the strap ploy for the free fighter free shoot, which means that you can pull the magna rail out and just gun someone down. Oh yeah. Because for anyone who doesn't know, the magna rail is I think it's five, three, mortal wounds three, AP two, unwieldy he- and not heavy. So you can normal move, dash, and then uh, pop the something for the ancestors ancestors, ancestors are watching yeah, yeah ancestors are watching you just pray to the gods just a little bit just tap someone with a two apl just delete her yeah it's nasty that's a pretty gnarly combo so, too i hadn't even thought about that that's a food for yeah. thought mm-hmm. the votan definitely read like a pretty cool team when it comes to the new pair for ashes of faith you know the chaos cults or the inquisition do you have you thought about any of the rules there matt yeah, the uh, the Imperial Agents, they seem like the... I talked about Exaction Squad earlier. These guys are what Exaction Squad wish they were. You know, the whole... Exaction Squad's got that thing where it's like, oh, you want to resolve your scouting step? No, I'm going to say, no, you can't do that. Uh, try, if you want to play a attack ploy that you wanted to use or a strap ploy that you wanted to use, and you can just say, no, you can't do that. Uh, that's insane. And then also, don't forget that scribe that... Uh, oh. Uh, domino field you want to play domino field again that's going to get me a cp like that is nuts so if you are a control player or i guess what i'm trying to say if you play magic and you play blue and you don't have and you don't like making friends this might be the team for you because this team <laughs> looks very oppressive for the agents and then for the uh for the cult i think they're super flavorful i love that transformation mechanic um i think they look like a, like another fun team i like that they have um, some range threat and not just like Gellerpox or like uh, the goats where they're just all melee uh, that icon guy they have I didn't pull up his stat sheet here he's I think the best he's got, flamer in the game yeah he's got an insane flamer yeah. right he's got a, yep, he I does. know Torrent's not very good but man that thing looked rough I think the big thing is Torrent 3 is like it's a it's a much like you know when I played Elucidity and Star Striders the difference between a blast 2 and a blast 3 profile is like wild and how many people it hits because people one it's you can space blast two. You really can't space blast three. Like someone no. is going to get hit that you don't want to get hit, and it's just like impossible to fully dodge. Yeah, well said. Yeah, that's um, great. Um, so also, real quick, vibe wise, I'm going to ask both of you. Vibe wise, <laughs> do you prefer the Inquisition or the Cults? Uh, Travis, you want to go first? I got, I want to put some thought into this. I got to think vibe wise. Which one's vibing with me? I grew up in a time where inquisitors were the shit so i really really <laughs> like the flavor of the inquisitors i have like three inquisitor models so i'll probably have the team built at some point just for the fun of it um so i'd probably say the inquisitors keep having so many like random callbacks i think is very very cute um so yeah. yeah i'm probably i'm probably gonna go with the cult or, or the, the, the plot the twist inquisitors. 
just, just so for everyone who for the iconarch the one the flamer guy that we were talking about he's got six attacks on twos two three range six torrent three but if he's close to your opponents he actually uh deals extra damage so he's a three four four and three gross that's nasty uh so well to be to, to bounce that off you then travis i will say i do honestly think that the cult is going to be the my my more my vibe while i will agree imperial agents the inquisition team you got uh definitely more kit bash potential i, I can see initially um i think the cults I mean, I just love their models. I uh, yeah. come on, like even like those bodyguard guys that you get, the ones oh, that yeah. uh, are melee, they're looking like uh, that Lord of the Rings villain. The names is not Sauron. Yeah, or the, they're they're like, looking, they like, look like the Nazgul. The Nazgul, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. look like Mead, man. This is uh, this box definitely to me is kind of like a like they knocked it out of the park on this 100%. box. It's yeah. honestly like, 100%. yes. Galifal was cool, but Ashes of Faith was like, oh, this is like this is the. This is the 40k energy that I want, like Imperial weirdos <laughs> and just like the worst elements of chaos kicking people yes. over. This Pretty much like since Kill Team 21 came out, like everywhere you go, like people are just like, when's Inquisition coming out? And like, there's just so much of that. And like, you know, the thing that they would be worried about, like GW would be like not meeting everyone's expectations because like there's so many people that are so hyped about it and like so many people have such a different interpretation. So the fact that the approach was like all that flexibility that they have really just mm. like gives it the flexibility to meet everyone's expectations. And I think they really, really did a good job of it. Like it looks incredible. Um, yeah. And then yeah. uh, vibe wise, I actually have like an entire eighth edition army, which was 100% Inquisition. So it was like it was also kind of started with like I was being cheap with with 40k, and I just like bought all the used models out of the bin, and then I would just like chop them up and convert them into using Death Watch rules. But I had like orcs and Chaos Space Marines and regular Space Marines and like Sisters of Battle and like all sorts of stuff that was all just like kit bash to be death watch it was inquisition themed and um i've made like a million kill teams into Inqui inquisition and like my vet guard are inquisition themed and like my blooded are inquisition themed and i've got like intercessors that are inquisition themed and like <laughs> everything so i'm just like i'm super ready for that but like vibe wise those the chaos called 100 percent has my number because like as soon as go. those models came out when they released them with the uh the chaos codex for ninth edition i was just like this i'm gonna buy these models even though i don't play this army and i don't think they're coming to kill team anytime soon so like i've got some of them and i've kind of been building them and uh it's super amazing that it's here now and i'm very excited you got yeah. your wish yeah, yeah you yeah. uh <laughs> and the fact that they put both of them in one box nuts oh yeah you probably through the moon, yeah. That's a. Uh, it, it was. I won't lie, like because I saw it. It had a narrative focus. That's what they led with too at the announcement. They're like, "Oh, this is a narrative box," and I'm not a narrative player, so it's like, okay, like that's that's nice for narrative players. But it's like, no, they uh, they put a lot of love into this box. I think it was something crazy. How many models come in it? Like it's like twenty seventy three or something. What? Oh my! I think gosh. it's because the chaos cult. You need, there's fifteen base models. Then there's I think there's like seven or eight mutants, and then there's like four tournaments or something That's and then on the inquisitor's side you get like two sprues for the caster or not the caster can the scions and you get a set of sisters and then you also get the seven weirdos along with all the extra bits to make all the rest of the weirdos so it's a it's a pretty wild box uh having done the review for the campaign segment that campaign segment actually looks very fun and very replayable so it's definitely a box that's got something for everyone well said Especially when we're talking about like Beastmen, you know, everyone's scared of the Beastmen. But when we get into next week's niche tactics about the cults and the Inquisition, we'll really talk about some <laughs> some scary teams. Yeah, I'll make sure to bring it. some sour cream to cool down that spice too. Oh, you're really leaning into that, huh? It's never gonna <laughs> end. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have to get some dry ice for for that th podcast because uh, ooh, cults and Inquisition—they're gonna be a spicy. Sheesh. I like that uh, the meme of the guy who's like you know he's uh, with his girlfriend and he's got his, his head turned looking at the uh, the other girl that's passing him and it's like meta players and he's holding the hand of beastmen and he sees the uh, imperial agents walking by, you know <laughs> it, it might be the team it might uh it might it might it might entice some people. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. But thanks again, Matt, for coming and talking about Pittsburgh.
Yeah, absolutely, guys. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Travis. I I mentioned this before the podcast started. I wanted to thank you especially. Uh, you you know, no one will know this, but for the listeners out there, um, when I was brand new to Kill Team and I'm just like going to these discords for the first time, and I was asking about the scene, Travis reached out. He gave me uh, the packet that he uses there he, um, up for his scene there, uh, up in New York and uh, with the Brooklyn Rats that they were. Um, <laughs> and it was uh, it was just incredible. Like, what a way to start off um, in a community that you know nothing about. It was an incredible first impression. And uh, I wanted to give a, you know, obviously a big thanks to you. Thanks to you, Travis, not only for having me, but for that experience as well. I'm glad to have done it because, you know, growing the scene has definitely been one of the most fun parts of um of running all this stuff for me. And that's why me and Jason are doing this podcast to help other people find out about other tournament scenes and all this other stuff. So I'm glad it worked out. Yes, absolutely. And find out about all the tactics that like other scenes that like, you know, maybe like no one in your scene is doing the boss knob throws the dynamite. And now you listen to this podcast and you know about the boss knob throwing the dynamite. What kind of hidden tech will you find out uh, next week as you listen to just another Kill Team podcast? Who knows what they might uncover. (laughs) <laughs> well thank you all for listening um once again if you're listening on a platform that accepts reviews uh definitely give us five stars i mean why wouldn't you and uh if you if you don't want to give us five stars tell us about the discord will we'll figure it out other than that friends thanks for listening see you next week